Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Good Grief. My name is Dr. Christine Malone, and in this podcast, we talk about trauma, tragedy, and survival. In each episode, I will interview someone that has gone through grief in some way, and we will discuss the impact it has had on their life. By sharing these stories, we hope that others won't feel alone should they be going through similar situations. Enjoy. Hey, listeners. Thank you so much for joining me for this special Mother's Day episode. I hope those of you who are moms or who are in the mom role are having a wonderful day today. So I had a blog I put out on Friday this last week about um, the dilemma of being a person who did not have a good mother. And when Mother's Day comes around, um, as we all know, of course, um, the Mother's Day commercials and the cards and the movies and so on always show these wonderful mothers who, you know, have these adoring children who love them. And once the mother's gone, they miss them. And I see that on social media and such all the time. But for those of us who didn't have a good mother, I, I want to share some of that with my listeners, because I think it's important to know that not everyone has the same experiences in life, um, both good and bad. So my mother was not a, a good mother. No, that's actually kind of putting it mildly. Um, she was always drunk. She was a, a, a lifetime alcoholic, and she was also physically abusive. Um, throughout my childhood, she was um, frequently angry about anything and everything. I quite honestly, I can remember several punishments, but I don't honestly remember what was the deed that I'd done or supposedly had done to to deserve whatever the punishment was. Um, I bear scars, physical scars from my childhood, um, as well as, of course, emotional scars. Um, my mother once told me uh, when I was in high school and she was angry about something, she told me that if abortion were legal the year I was born, I wouldn't be here. So you kind of get the idea of the sort of mother she was. Um, I didn't have friends come over when I was a kid, mostly because I was embarrassed. I didn't want my friends to to see what kind of home life I had. I, I wanted to hide that um, because I knew it wasn't what most people had. At least I hoped it wasn't what most people had. And I really wanted um, people to kind of keep that that knowledge. I didn't want them to know it. I didn't want them to know what, what my life was like. So when I was an adult, um, because, you know, Mother's Day, we're supposed to celebrate our mothers, I would send my mother a Mother's Day card. Now, Mother's Day cards, for those of you who buy them or receive them, are usually wonderful cards that talk about how much we love our mother and how much we appreciate all the things she's done for us. Um, it's not easy to find a Mother's Day card that doesn't say that kind of stuff. So when I would send her one, I would usually just buy a blank card and inside I would write, Happy Mother's Day, Christine. Um, and I'd send it to her. So I kind of felt like that societal obligation was there and I needed to send her something, even though really I didn't celebrate her on, on Mother's Day. So once I had kids of my own, though, um, and I realized that it really was kind of a charade, I stopped sending her those cards and she never asked about it. I never explained it, which we just we just let it go. So we didn't spend a lot of time talking to one another <clears throat> in my adult life. And if you've read my autobiography, um, the Spider Killer book, you'll read some of my my stories in there about kind of my my experiences with my mom. But at the end of her life, uh, she had cancer. And at the end of her life, she was living in Florida, which was across the country from me in Seattle. And I hadn't spoken to her in, I don't know, a couple of years, I guess. I don't honestly remember when the last time was I spoke to her, what the conversation was about. But she had cancer. And her husband, whom I'd, I'd never met, this husband, I believe it was her third, possibly fourth husband, um, he called me. And it was a Saturday in December. And he said, um, your mother's not likely going to live long. So if you'd like to talk with her, she'd like to talk with you, give her a call. Um, I was at a Christmas party for a work group and I hung up the phone and I went back to the Christmas party and sang karaoke. So not only did I, was I not affected by the, by the, the knowledge that my mother was likely to pass soon. It just, it did nothing. It did nothing for me emotionally at all. So the following morning, um, my mother's husband called and let me know that she'd passed away in the, in the early morning hours. Um, I gave him my condolences and said, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. I, I hope everything works out okay. Um, and I let it go with that. Uh, for the next couple of weeks, he sent me boxes of knickknacks and things from my mother's stuff, um, none of which meant anything to me. So I, about, after about the third box, I 
sent him a message and said, you know, just donate it to the secondhand store if it's something you don't want. But really, none of this is something that I want. And I just want you to save the postage on, on what you um, what you're sending to me. So I, I teach classes. And when I share that story in my class about grief, it never fails. I end up with students who just sit there shocked that I sang karaoke rather than called my mother the night that before she died. And I know that some of you are listening to this and thinking, wow, she must be the most cold hearted person ever. But I do want to remind you that grief is directly related to how much we care for the thing that we lost. Um, and I didn't really care about my mother. It wasn't an angry thing. It was, I just didn't have that relationship. Um, and I sure wasn't going to miss anything about her. So um, I didn't, I didn't wish her ill. I didn't wish her any extra pain. I'm not glad that she died of cancer. I just didn't have any more feeling for her than I did the local grocery clerk. It just wasn't, it wasn't any, there was nothing there. So for those um, of you who do or did have wonderful mothers, I, I want you to know, um, actually, I, I want to ask you to not judge those of us who didn't. Um, we didn't choose that, right? If I'd, if I'd been able to choose, I would, I would love to have had a wonderful mother who made cookies and, and told me she loved me. I, I would I would give anything for that. It would be an awesome experience, but it wasn't what I had. So know that I'll speak for myself. I'm, I'm envious of those of you who tell me wonderful stories about your mom or I see on, on social media, I miss my mom so much or these kind of comments. I just, I think that's just fantastic. Um, but what I did is I did the very best I could to be the best mom I could be to my own children. Um, and I think I've done a pretty good job. So for the second part of this podcast, you're going to hear an interview with a guest whose mother is still with us. Um, and he shares all the wonderful things that she's done in his life as he's dealt with some pretty serious health concerns. So again, happy Mother's Day for those of you out there who um, are moms or are in the mom role. Um, and thank you so much for joining me today. Okay, listeners, thank you for joining me for this episode. My guest today is going to tell us a story about his mom and how she has supported him through some health issues that he's had. So guest, if you would like to introduce yourself, please. Sure, uh, my name is Mark Demeray. <clears throat> um, I uh, work for the uh, for the Everett Clinic up there in Everett, Washington. Um, I worked there for almost 16 years now. Uh, my mom, I have put her through too much. And it's not the traditional uh, rebellious type or anything like that, but I started having health issues at the age of two. I have what they call hydrocephalus. So I, my brain fluid, um, I produce too much, and so they have to find a way to drain that. And so they put in what they call a shunt that um, then drains down uh, into my abdomen to kind of, you know, uh, normalize the amount of fluid and the pressure of the fluid. Well, I had to have that redone uh, when I was in junior high. They didn't do it right, so they had to go in and put it, what they call an anti-siphoning device in uh, a couple of weeks later. And I thought everything was fine until um, kind of in my early 30s, um, I was actually at, at the point where I was at work one day and just had the weirdest feeling that um, it was almost like a stroke. I, I, it's, it's tough to, um, to kind of describe that. Um, so went to the walking clinic. No, it's not a stroke. Um, but Ultimately, they decided, oh, your, your shunt hardware has broken. we got to replace it. Okay, no, no big deal. You know, you, you go in, you have the surgery, you're over there, you're there overnight, and off we go. So they did that. Well, then about four weeks later, I developed a staph infection mm. in my brain fluid. That's not good. And... Uh, no, and ended up in the ICU at the University of Washington, and it ended up for being about three weeks, and they did three more surgeries, 
to try and get rid of the infection, move things around, all these kinds of things. In, in the meantime, my mom, who lives in um, Paulsbo, Washington, um, so that is a ferry ride away, um, came every day and sat there with me. And that's asking a lot. <laughs> uh, because there wasn't really anything going on. I was just laying there waiting for the next surgery. And, you know, they come in and they, they poke and they prod and they take blood and all those kinds of different things. And she was right there. Um, and I had given her enough scares um, with the the first few surgeries, but now they got to do four more. Um, and I, I am not a parent, but I cannot imagine what that must have done to her, knowing that I kept having to go, go wander and get, uh, and get surgery. So it's, uh, but it shows how much she, she cared that, Hey, I, I, we'll take the ferry twice a day if we have to, <laughs> um, and and to come over and help you. I, I finally had to tell her, take the day off. There's nothing's going to go on today. You you can go home. You can do chores. You can do laundry. You can you know whatever. Um, and oh no no I'll be no. You're going to go home and you're going to take care of yourself, too. Um, so, Well, I do have and, children, and I can tell you that uh, as a mom, when one of my kids is not doing well, there is very little I wouldn't do to help them. So um, your story is obviously shows that your mom is a, is a great mom, and I love to hear those kinds of stories. And are you an only child, or do you have siblings, too? Uh, I have a younger brother okay. who lives down in the, the Portland area. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and so they, um, they, they're the ones that have given them grandchildren. Ah, okay. Um, and so they, uh, so they go down and, and see them quite a bit. Yeah. Well, that's nice. That's nice. I know one of my, one of my kids gave me yeah. grandkids too. So, you know, somebody in the group has to give us grandkids as, a, as our grandmother things part part. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Um, if your if your mom was listening to your podcast uh, today, what what message would you want her to know? I want to know, I want her to know that I appreciate that more than it she would ever understand that um, that having that support meant everything. And even now, a few years later, I've been going through my own different health issues. She was actually here yesterday at my house, helping me with things that I have not been able to do on my own. I have suffered with some extremely annoying um, vertigo episodes and dizziness and lack of energy and things of that nature and she came over and she's like well i'll come over and we'll i'll, I'll bring you um soups out of the freezer and i'll come over and vacuum and those kinds of things and it, it is such a help um yeah. especially when i there, like last week as an example, I couldn't get from my living room to the bathroom without breathing hard. And I live in a 900 square foot condo. Mm. So um, it's, it's been really rough. Uh, I, I truly was a shut in for about 10 days. Uh, and she said, oh, I'll, I'll come over, I'll come over, I'll come over. Um, she does not hesitate on that one. And that, 
that is, is still appreciated. And so I, I, I would hope that that's what she would get out of this. Yeah. Well, uh, Mark's mom, if you're listening, I appreciate that you were a really good mom to Mark because <laughs> I think that's a fabulous story. It actually makes me kind of tear up a little bit to hear that. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so Mark, anything else you'd like to share before we finish today? Uh, well, I, I just, uh, I appreciate the fact that, especially when you were younger, she did a lot of this as a single mom. Um, my folks divorced when I was six. And while dad didn't move very far away, um, she kept everything together. And, you know, you know, I was six and my brother was barely a year old. And how do you do that? as a single mom I don't know yeah and we had we had some support um, from her, from her folks that lived in town but um, it it was just amazing what what she has been willing and able to do to help both myself um, and my brother, because when he goes, he, he doesn't go very often, but when he does go out of town for business, um, she'll go down and, and help my sister-in-law uh, with the kids and doesn't really even have to be asked. <laughs> yeah. So she just goes and does it. She just, she's got that heart, that, that mom and that yep. grandma heart, which is wonderful to hear about. Yeah. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being my guest today and sharing your story about your mom. I, I love the uplifting one. So I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Glad to be with you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Good Grief. To hear more about my personal story, please pick up a copy of my book, The Day I Became the Spider Killer, a memoir of trauma, tragedy, and survival, available in paperback, Kindle, and Audible via Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online book retailers.